Okay. So first question here, Hendrik from Germany sends in a couple questions. The first one I'm just going to read for right now. That way we can ponder over it and probably come back to it on another episode. But it's a good question that I wanted to read in there here. So Hendrik says, uh, what's new in science? As I came over from Dylan's YouTube videos and have a background in science, although a completely different discipline myself, I always wanted to be up to date with the latest scientific findings. So an episode where you discuss new findings and maybe tell us listeners in which field there will be a new studies, that would be great. Uh, the, through your episodes, we could hear from this uh, or the new study or research, but one big episode where you get an overview would be really nice. So he's saying like, you know, we've, we've talked about some of like, you know, newer emerging, emerging, um, like studies in the field, but, um, he's kind of requesting one big episode. So I think, I think it'd be cool for us to do an episode like that, where we just talk about some of the latest findings. Um, so wanted to read I that do here. Have one thing I do have one yeah. thing to uh, like mention that like a year ago, I remember Siler talking about how he was in the process of doing research on respiration like respiration rate and our breathing rate you know like we have heart rate and power and he was doing studies and research on like looking at how quick people breathe i guess like breaths per minute or something and yeah. i remember thinking like oh i'm i'm curious about that so him asking this question has like re-sparked my interest in like i wonder if siler has put out that research yet or if he's still if it's still happening so well, I'll why don't we to, pull together a full episode yeah. where we can find out ahead of time? I'll have to do some <laughs> homework. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. So leaving that one out there for next time. Uh, second question here from Henrik. He says, marginal versus maximal gains in training. Like your earlier episode, but the more general gains, uh, what uh, you know, an episode or a topic focused on uh, all the maximal gains you can have in training, such as altitude training, heat training, carbon dioxide inhalation, block periodization, etc. It's hard to focus on what's really important for one's own training and what is just something to get the last one or two percent out of your body. Really, really looking forward to you answering this in the next podcast. So really what Henrik's trying to get at here is what are some of those like maximal versus marginal uh, aspects of training that you can implement. Um, so you can make sure you're covering the broadest bases in your training and not focusing too much on those minimal gains. That's only going to get you that, you know, half a percent or 1%, you know, that kind of final push to get you to your maximum potential, um, which should be largely saved for the last part of your training. Yeah. I like this question. Because I think a lot of people focus on, I mean, I'm a marginal gains guy, but <laughs> I think a lot of people focus on very marginal gains when they're leaving a lot of big stuff untapped. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can start with most basic and then obviously get more and more niche and more and more uh, marginal if you want. I, I would say the most basic is you want to address... Uh, frequency, volume, and intensity in that order. So when I'm talking about frequency, volume, and intensity, frequency is uh, the amount that you train per week, say. It's just the frequency with, with which you're training. Volume is the duration that you're training. Um, like how, how long are you training per session? How much are you training per week? And then intensity is how hard are those training sessions? And you want to do it in that order. So if you are currently training twice a week, you want to get that to three times a week. If you're training three times a week, you want to get that to four times a week. If you're training four times a week, you want to get that to five. Like you want to increase your frequency if you're at that stage. And then I would say, at least with cycling, if you're at the point where you're training five to six times a week, that's probably where you can cap off your frequency. There are other endurance sports where pretty much any other endurance sport, running, cross-country skiing, rowing, swimming, where they train multiple times per day. So you could further increase the frequency like that. But for the most part, cycling is a, is even professional cyclists train once a day, mostly. So at the point that you get to five to six times per week, you know, you do want to give yourself recovery. So I, I don't necessarily think that seven times per week is, is better than six times per week. Um, but then, then you've got your frequency handled and then you can start thinking about volume. So if you're training five hours a week, 
you know, in order to overload your body, maybe you try to do six, try to do seven, try to do eight and see how high you can get your volume. Uh, a lot of people kind of naturally hit a point where, uh, you know, like 10 or 12 hours per week is the most that I can handle with my schedule. Maybe it's not the most that my body can handle, but my schedule will only allow that. And then you want to address intensity by adding in, you know, intervals on certain days or, or, you know, something specific to your race that you're training for or, or whatever. And it should be in that order. I would say before you start thinking about anything having to do with, <laughs> you know, I don't know, altitude or like supplements or uh, block periodization or whatever, anything that he listed, you need to have that down pat and then you can start thinking about those other things. Yeah, so one one thing I want to touch on there. So when you're talking about volume versus frequency, you, you actually specifically said you you should prioritize frequency over volume. Um, and so just to kind of splice that apart, so if an athlete, let's say, is training one day a week, they, they, they can't mm -hmm. train any other day except Saturday, they can go out and do a five-hour smash fest. You're saying mm -hmm. you'd rather see that athlete disperse that throughout the week and do like one hour, five days a week than try and do one yes. five hour ride a week. Yes. I just want to so clear that for people. As, as high level, you know, as high level athletes and, and, you know, I, I guess high level coaches, we don't talk about frequency that much because most of the athletes, athletes we work with, uh, they've already got their frequency maxed out. But for a lot of, I would say... Uh, I don't know what the right word is here because like most people who ride a bike, they don't ride a bike every day. They like maybe ride a bike on the weekends or something like that's what weekend warrior means. Yeah. But fr frequency is, is usually the first hurdle to get through for most, for just most average Joes is like actually riding a bike frequently enough um, that you're somebody, somebody who's going from like, I just started riding to now I want to train like, sure. I yeah. think when you'd make that mental shift of like, I want to train, the first thing you got to do is be like, okay, what days can I train? And that's what you're saying is like, you need to start filling in some of those weekdays. Yeah. Frequency very much is like the first thing that you need to address. So if you're not riding your bike six times a week, then you, you have room to improve with in frequency. I feel like it's the same as calling it consistency or similar. Consistency is just like doing all the right things, checking all the boxes and in order to get better at cycling. You should cycle more. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So then uh, to go back to touching on one of the things. So, um, you know, so frequency, got to work on that. Dylan's talking about, you know, training, you know, riding your bike at least five days a week. If you're a cyclist, um, maybe six, depending on your availability and, dedication. Um, but now, you know, now going into the volume increase, uh, let's say, you know, you, you touched on other sports <clears throat> can, you know, they, they tend to implement two a days. And usually that's because it's, <clears throat> it's harder for them to extend their workout sessions longer just because of the physical limits of the body versus on the bike, you can almost infinitely extend the duration of a, of a ride, you know, mm -hmm. within, within reason. Um, but let's say, you know, due to time constraints, an athlete cannot extend their rides more, but they could fit in extra rides throughout their week. Would that be something that you would recommend as a way for someone to increase their volume without, um, you know, without increasing the duration of their sessions per se? So like, let's say instead of doing five sessions a week, they're now doing eight sessions a week because they can fit in three extra one hour rides. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's, I, I, again, I think that, you know, when you start getting into, when you start hitting the constraints of your schedule, anything that you can do to improve that volume is, is usually good. Um, I know that there's, there's probably some coaches that would disagree with this, but I, I think that, <laughs> that for most athletes, uh, with, if they can increase their volume, that's, that's like one of the single best things that they can do for their training. Um, because most athletes don't have problems doing very hard workouts 
you know, they can push themselves hard on their intensity sessions. Uh, and I would say most athletes, if they're serious, they are already riding five to six times a week. So I'm, I'm talking about frequency and intensity here, but it's just, you know, the difference between 10 hours a week and 12 hours a week or 12 hours a week and 15 hours a week. Um, yeah, I, I, I think volume is huge. Yeah. And I think in the past you've referenced some studies where they've actually, you know, they've actually shown this where they take two groups of athletes, both athletes are subjected to the same duration of intensity or same, you know, frequency of intensity. Um, but one, one subset, let's say does an extra two or three hours of training a week. I don't remember what it was. Um, but they do a different type of intensity compared to the other sub subgroup. Um, and, and, and I think what I remember from the study was it almost didn't really matter which type of intensity they were doing. The, the group that was doing more volume always came out on top. Mm -hmm. And also, I think a, an important thing to remember is that you can't make up for volume by doing more intensity. Uh, like they've done studies right. where they have people increase the amount of intensity sessions that they're doing and it doesn't it doesn't lead to uh further fitness gains unless we're talking about something niche like block periodization which needs to be very appropriately planned um usually they just find that those people are more tired more fatigued uh and not necessarily faster at all hmm I wish I, I wish I understood this in college. Like I remember being in college and, uh, I don't think I was trying to do a, a ton of intensity. Like I wasn't doing more than two or three intensity sessions a week, but I wasn't trying to up my volume. Um, cause I was focused on cyclocross racing and I thought, well, a cyclocross race is only one hour. So what do I need to go do really long rides for? But in hindsight, I think like even as a cyclocross racer, if I had, because in college I had so much more free time than I do now, I wish I had taken advantage of that and like just rode, like just bumped my volume up like way more. I think that would have paid like dividends for the long run had I done that. But I didn't understand this concept of like increase your volume and that's like an easy way to, or not easy, but a simple way to increase fitness. I mean, is that sure. right? Like, is there, is yeah, there, I mean, I mean you, maybe I'm asking about a question it. at the same time, like for somebody who is focused on crit racing and cyclocross, you're saying that it still makes sense to do more volume instead of trying to do more. Well, yeah. So, so if you, if you break it down a crit race or a cyclocross race, let's call it, you know, 60 to 75 minutes is more or less just a, a, a measure of your threshold, right. For the, as far as the effort goes, you know, you're, you're trying to, you know, you're going to end up holding as pretty close to your threshold for that entire duration when you look at like normalized power or something. So if you can increase your threshold, your performance is going to be better. And one of the best ways to increase your threshold is doing more volume. Yeah. We, we would say the same thing, but say it in two different ways. So I would say a crit is about repeatability and the way to support that repeatability is through your aerobic base. Mm. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Which is also supported by more volume. So, yeah. Yeah. Now it, the, the, the polar extreme, you know, like when you're looking at like track races or and it, and that has to be really short track races. And I'm even actually thinking more of like running track races. Like when you're getting really short and you're talking about, like the 400 meter where you're getting like under a minute. Um, those, I think they've, you know, there, there have been some arguments that there is an upper limit to how much volume you want to do just so that your, your training sessions can be more higher quality. Um, but I, the, the large majority of cycling related uh, races are, are going to be, are going to fall, you know, way into the aerobic um, realm. Yeah. I mean, just like with everything, there's, uh you can you can train too much absolutely there's there is such a thing as too much volume i guess the argument that i'm making is that almost no one falls into that category because they've got time natural time constraints in their schedule you know what i mean um like everybody's got kids and a family and a job and you know drew you're not special like everybody's got kids yeah, um, no, i know <laughs> but what i'm saying is like i wish i could call up dizzle in college that didn't have kids and wasn't married and had yeah, like 
easy also, college classes. <laughs> like I could have just called up college Dizzle and said, dude, get off your bum and go train. Dude, you know how many people wish they could tell the their younger selves yeah. a piece of advice? <laughs> yeah. Nah, screw all the other advice. I would just tell myself, train more. Stop yeah, being no, a bum. <laughs> now, one thing I will say, so like, you know, one thing you touched on there, Dylan, was uh, you said like, you know, most people, because of time constraints, they're not they're not reaching their potential for upper limit volume wise. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just talking just straight exercising, mm -hmm. uh, you know, upper constraint, you know, if you're, if you only have, if you can only squeeze in 12 hours a week of training and you're training every single week, that maximum limit of 12 hours, and it's contributing to excess stress elsewhere in your life, you probably will reach a breaking point doing that. So mm -hmm. there is an upper limit for everyone relative to what their, what their schedule permits. And pushing that envelope too frequently can definitely cause some burnout, but it can also cause just some inconsistency. You know, it's like you train 12 hours, three weeks in a row or four weeks in a row, five weeks in a row. Um, and then all of a sudden you just reach that breaking point and either you start getting sick or you just, you know, the rest of life catches up to you. Um, you know, I'll even have sometimes an athlete that will do in the first week of like our training block. They're like, you know, they come off a rest week. They're really excited. Uh, they just want to, you know, get back into training and they do that 12 hour week. And then all of a sudden the next week they can only do six hours and the next week they're only doing five hours. Cause it's like they, they, they use too much of that, uh, of that time allotment in that first week. And it just, other things got pushed to the side that then they had to, you know, catch up on later. So you do want to be mindful of, you know, what, at what point does your volume start to deteriorate your frequency is, is really what I'm getting at. Um, because it, it, if, if it starts to contribute to a lack of consistency, then the vol you're probably overdoing the volume mm -hmm. or you need to work on other parts of your life. And then if you keep going down that road, you take one step further, you say, at what point does the intensity start to affect the volume or no, 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 sorry. Other way around. What time, <laughs> at what point does the volume start to affect the intensity? Cause you have to like to get faster, you have to do intervals, but if you're doing so much volume that you're too tired on your interval days to hit your numbers and to hit, do a workout, then more volume isn't doing you any good. Like you still need to get in those, those two good intensity sessions a week. Cause like if we could train intensity every day of the week, we like that would get us faster, but our bodies just can't handle more than two, maybe three sessions a week. And that's why you have to supplement with endurance rides and volume. But if you're doing so much endurance and so much volume that now your intensity days are compromised, it's like, you're you're putting the what is it you're putting the horse before the cart or the cart before the horse <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like i have all these things in my the, head i just don't know how to say it usually goes in yeah. front of the cart because it pulls you're the cart, your cart you're putting your cart before your horse <laughs> yeah it's a saying look it up yeah that's that's how you that's how you that's actually i had a video about how much volume is too much volume and that's oh, me how too yeah yeah you copied mine <laughs> i did not mean to <laughs> i did not know but that basically that's how good. you that's how you know that your volume is too high you can't complete your intensity sessions because your overall training load from having such a high volume is too too much so i mean i guess the point we're making is like all three of these things are always at play with each other so if you yeah. like you if you mess with one too much it's going to affect the other ones and you you kind of have to keep all three in balance yeah, I would say more so for a serious cyclist, you keep two in balance because frequency should always be maxed out uh, unless yeah. it's the off season, in which case you take a break. But you, there's I, I can never think of a scenario where other than the off season or a mid season break where you should purposefully decrease frequency for some reason. Yeah. So when we when we train our new coaches with ignition, this is one of the first on session one, we talk about communication, but on session two, we talk all about training. And this is like one of the very first slides that we that I show. It's this triangle that has frequency, volume, and intensity. But I added in the middle of the triangle, do you know what I added into the middle? Supplements. <laughs> no. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> no, fatigue, fatigue. Like, yeah, I think that's the, another piece of that puzzle that often gets forgotten about. 
because you can't just keep increasing all three. And we've already been talking about fatigue and recovery the whole time. But in when I when like yeah when we sh when we talk about this with our new coaches, I put that fatigue in the middle of the triangle because that's like so important. Like play with all three of those parameters all you want, but if fatigue starts to become an issue, it almost doesn't matter. Like the whole thing's gonna fall apart. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it the uh the image that I'm getting is like as fatigue or as you know, volume stretches in one direction and intensity stretches in another direction, the wall of the triangle gets too thin and the fatigue starts to like permeate out. It's like leaky mm. gut syndrome. It's like yeah. It starts to just like you guys ooze are really everywhere. going overboard with the metaphors now. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Love it. All right, should we yeah. should we move on? Like, because we've spent a lot of time talking about the bare basics of yeah, this question, and we haven't yeah. even gotten to the yeah. But that's good. Sometimes, like going hard in the in the basics, like it didn't look didn't um didn't like Kobe Bryant wasn't he famous for saying something like. The ba like he talked about the basics like dribbling it was it or maybe it was mj but he said he would always talk about like back to the fundamentals basics. the fundamentals yeah. yes yeah. adam would know who was it <laughs> did you know who was it <laughs> i think it was kobe yeah kobe was all about the fundamentals like you got to be good at dribbling before you yeah. can be good agreed at yeah agreed yeah all right. So Hendrick did want like a more, more thorough list. He gave examples of like <clears throat> altitude training, periodization, but I feel like covering those first three is the most important and then recovery. And then the rest, I feel like is so specific to the athlete. So I love this question, but I hate this question too, because. Well, so I, I do mean, think, I do think that there is a, a next, a next one after uh, uh frequency I've... volume and intensity i do think that there's an important next one uh it's not as important as frequency volume and intensity but i i would say it's it's Recovery. almost to the point where it's a fundamental and that would be periodization periodization yeah yeah well i don't know if this is outside the parameters of the question but i almost think that and maybe this is just i'm answering the question wrong but i think sleep and nutrition get over overlooked as well like Oh, yeah. Like people talk about heat acclimatization. If you're not sleeping enough, who cares if you're heat acclimated? Like, yeah, you need I, to sleep. I would put that <laughs> as I, I would just blanket that as recovery. OK, I think and I think so, all that. So mm -hmm. sleep and nutrition would just be blanketed. So, into OK, recovery. here's yeah. here's a question for you guys. Are we I think we all agree that frequency, volume and intensity is like the very first thing. But where are we ranking recovery? versus periodization what's well, more I was important gonna, i was mm. gonna even say that sleep and nutrition you could make the argument that sleep and nutrition are more important than those three things because if you're not sleeping good and eating good you're not yeah, even but gonna be a, you're not even gonna be a healthy human much if you're less a, hu a healthy athlete i mean i kind of agree but also you have to train at all to even be good at riding a bike i know but you have to be healthy in order to train and if you're not sleeping I, you're not I don't eating know if i wouldn't i don't know if i no, would no, no. i i think that you could train if you're training and you sleep terribly and you eat terribly you will be faster than if you don't train but you sleep great and you eat great yeah oh, okay well when you put it that way well i've been thinking about this a lot yeah i can confirm that lack of sleep is very detrimental to training um did you guys talk about that did you guys have a baby or something why is the what do you mean you lack of like all of a well, sudden you had this that's lack not of the sleep. only reason why people <laughs> don't get sleep owner of the cpap machine we talked yeah. about this on a oh, recent podcast oh, yes that's right guys i'm a new person yeah <laughs> i woke yeah. up crying one morning because i was like is this how people feel i went from having 40 episodes an hour which is severe apnea to like between four and five like that's crazy so okay so you're saying you're you're getting more sleep than you've ever had yes yeah better sleep yeah okay so yeah, i thought you meant the other the way above. i thought you meant the other way around like when you have a kid you get less sleep than you've ever Drew, had. people lose sleep for other reasons other than having i know a kid. i know but <laughs> that's like the one that people talk about the most it's the one you talk about the most. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So <laughs> All right. But... So are we all in agreement that uh, recovery, very important, but it goes after frequency, volume, intensity? Wait, wait, wait. I'm not finished yet. So Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, 
sleep what shoot what i was gonna say oh i've been thinking about this a lot i feel like to help an athlete be reach their optimal performance i'm kind of on the side of drew like they need to be their optimal healthy self and in order to do that that's sleep and nutrition okay so we're not in somebody's hitting hitting you know mcdonald's every night after work so we're so so (laughs) well just to clarify we're not in agreement here well, the way Dylan said it does make sense. Like you could, it yeah, they, what he said, it like if somebody's on... eating McDonald's and barely sleeping, so here's, training, he... they're still going to beat somebody. Yeah. Here's a thought. So, so I think it's, I mean, it's all important, but let's, let's, let's assume we're talking about people that are, that are interested in training. They want to train to get better, right? Like that's what this conversation is all about. So here's an example. When an ath- a new athlete comes to me, um, Maybe there's an exception of like they're very, very well trained and they um, have short term goals in mind that we need to hit the ground running for. Um, with that exception, with, with that, you know, assuming that's not one of the exceptions, most of the time when an athlete comes to me, I set their first month of training where all three weeks are the exact same week of training. And the reason mm-hmm. I do that is because I want them to work on their consistency, their routine. Mm-hmm. And part of that is working on their recovery within that routine without having to worry about mixing up their workouts, not knowing, you know, what their volume is going to be for that day or having to increase their volume for that day and trying to figure out new routes to do. It's like, Hey, here's your first week, figure it out. The next three weeks or next two weeks are just going to be repeats of that. And that gives them time to work on some of these other aspects. And, and one of the things that I, that I focus on with that first conversation with them is exactly what Caitlin's saying. Like, and Drew, you're talking about is like, you need to be, overall like a you know in a a good steady state as a as a healthy being um in order for us to like progress with your training because the harder and harder the training gets the more behind you're going to get if you're not sleeping well you're not recovering well so that first month like gives them the chance to to, like figure out that routine that allows them to get that recoverability uh as as part of that routine um and and that's like that's a way that it affords them to do that and that's kind of i think what you guys are getting at is like before we can make this athlete better, we need to make sure that they're doing things that they can that they can control to recover, to sleep well, to get nutrition dialed, um, to support their body through the adaptations that are going to be forthcoming. Okay, so are we putting sleep and nutrition before or after? That's what I like. That's <laughs> that's what I'm getting at. Are we putting it before or after? It depends after? on the person I'm, too, yeah. because if we have you know, an athlete, a seasoned athlete, you know, they do all the right things, sleep and nutrition wise, like the next thing for them is periodization. Well, I'm not saying before periodization. I'm saying, are we putting, are we putting sleep, sleep and nutrition before the fundamental frequency volume intensity? I actually, I, I actually, I, we're not, mm, I, I I was almost going to (laughs) say, I I think I actually might now. (laughs) Because that's really that's really easy think... to control. Like it, yeah. you can you can fig you can correct bad sleep habits within a couple weeks. So like if an athlete came to me and said like, you know, hey, I'm really eager to train, but I'm only sleeping four hours a night. I might. Yeah, but say, you can well, also correct bad training habits. You know, instantly if you if they're doing bad training habits and then you tell them to do something else. It's not about how how Agreed. quickly you but, can but remedy point, the situation. At what point yeah. are those improvements in training going to hit a plateau because they're not recovering enough? So and, if it if if I can give an athlete a two week period and say, hey, I know you want to start training, but I need you to come back to me in two weeks after you've proven to me that you're sleeping seven hours a night, and then once you're sleeping seven hours a night, now we'll introduce some new training habits. I'd I'd rather do that because it's going to be way harder for them to correct their sleep patterns and in recovery patterns amidst hard training. And okay. if you uh, like, if you think about it in terms of FTP. Like if somebody goes from sleeping four hours to eight hours, their FTP is going to go up like 50, 50 watts. Just not if they they're... don't train. If yeah, they but, don't train, but, their FTP won't go up at I all. No, but listen, if they're, let's just assume they're training the same amount. Like yeah, this yeah, is yeah. The, this is like a, a there's like let's say they go from four hours of sleep to eight hours. They're overnight or maybe within two days once they catch up. <laughs> <laughs> two <laughs> nights, give me two nights, and their FTP is going to go up. A, you know, boatload. So you're t- you're talking but, but as if far you, as maximal gains that you're. Well, but I'm also saying, saying like what Dylan is saying. Yeah, you could remedy the training quickly as well, but that's only going to lead to like 
a couple of watts. Like it's going to take a long time for the training remedy to actually take effect because that's how training works. Training is right. like for the long haul. You sleep, you, you fix your sleep and it's like immediate, like listen to what Caitlin mm -hmm. said. She like was getting better sleep and was like immediately felt better. And I can guarantee you that leads to an increased FTP. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I think it could be argued either way. Yeah, I think so too. I think that's what we've landed on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're, uh... It depends on the okay. person could be argued either way. All right. So, so, so I would say, I would argue that periodization. after that is periodization and periodization is basically just how your training changes over time. And if you do want to improve at a certain point, your training, training does need to change over time. You can't just do the same training week over and over and over and over again. That's, uh, that's how you're going to hit a plateau. So I would say periodization is like the next, you know, low hanging fruit that you can easily pick. Agreed. Yep. And just to add a note here, periodization does not need to be, doesn't have to be more complex. Mm -hmm. It just means you're, you're training the right energy systems and overloading those properly for what your goals are. Yeah. Um, all right. What, what did, what specifically did he list? I mean, we can list uh, so other he, things. He other mentioned some other, yes. Yeah, so you so mentioned some other things. This is where it goes like... from marginal, or sorry, where it starts to switch from max out on a marginal, right? Because now we're asking it. Yeah, about... potentially. Yeah. Because I would say, I would say a next, <clears throat> a, the next one to throw in would be strength training. Mm. Yeah, yeah. He didn't even list that in there, did he? Nope. That and would, that would be, that's like, that's like the next thing I'm reaching for is strength training. Yeah, I forgot about strength training. Good, good point. Okay. Uh, and and now, like part of part of what makes it more maximal than marginal is that we're we're talking generalized here. So mm -hmm. uh, every athlete could benefit from all yeah. of these things we've talked about so far. Whereas some yeah. of these next ones that we'll get into might be more specific to each athlete, which is kind of Caitlin, what you were saying is like the part of the question that makes it more challenging because we don't know it. it there, you can't just generalize uh, or gen generally um, implement this. So uh, altitude training, heat training. I, I don't know what this is. Carbon dioxide inhalation training. Is that what um, you're talking so about? Is that, like is that in the tour breath work? Where they were, where they were like sucking in. Um, that was carbon monoxide, wasn't it? Nobody's I, breathing carbon monoxide. Yeah, but no, they, I, there, there was I, something I, whack there like was. that. Yeah. What? Yeah. Somebody here, Adam, you're going to have to look that up real quick. I yeah, think that somebody, might have been what they were doing in the tour. Yeah, it was like some one. I think something it was like Vizma that, yeah. or somebody was doing it in the yeah, tour. Yeah, inhaling carbon monoxide. Yeah, it was uh, <laughs> look at Vizma face. and UAE. Yeah. <laughs> it's some new it's, thing, it's, Caitlin. Yeah, far beyond it's, our. It's they they call it super altitude training because like carbon monoxide, you're basically just taking a ton of the oxygen out of the air. That was also I, okay. I don't so think any of us know enough about? I can't. It. I I can't remember the exact specifics of this, but also that might have been a test to see how altitude acclimated they were. Mm. It's not even. It's not even for the purposes of. Training. improving their altitude acclimation it's just a test to see how well acclimated they are no gotcha. it's it's no it no oh. it says here uh <laughs> <laughs> nah, this is wrong. this is from bicycling magazine you know but they're they're kind of uh summarizing it here but it says a carbon monoxide rebreather is a device some cycling teams use to help their riders adapt to altitude training it works by administering a precise dose of carbon monoxide to the lungs which allows doctors and coaches to measure critical blood metrics, particularly hemoglobin. Oh, so maybe maybe you're right. Yeah, though. measure measure it's, like it's, they're it's measuring measure. they're measuring okay. hemoglobin and me like I, I think it's a measurement device. It's not even something that they're doing to improve improve their response to altitude. So okay. I mean, as far as marginal versus maximal yeah. gains go, that's like okay. the most right. marginal I could possibly yeah. think of. Like, and just straight up. Yeah, dangerous. Bottom of the list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, because it because yeah, okay, you're right, Dylan. So so reading further here, like they're they're using this to measure how well adapted they are, so they know how to adjust like uh, their altitude uh, adaptation yeah. protocol. 
Yeah, so That's that me. one is like, you know, I mean, kick that one to the curb. That's not even... I don't even know why this guy included that in the list, to be <laughs> he honest. He might not have even... I, I think... thought he was no, referencing he's, your he says carbon, carbon dioxide, dioxide tolerance. Yeah, it's which carbon is a dioxide legit inhalation. Legit thing. I didn't know about that. Whatever. Anyway, There's... so... It's like I mean it's not it's not important. Like that's so that's so marginal that I feel like we don't even need to necessarily discuss it, but Agreed. Are we done talking <laughs> oh, about strength one. strength training? So we're are we we're bouncing all over the place. Are we is there one that comes after strength training? I would say yes. So Let's if hear. and but it's dependent on if this applies to the athlete or not. If they're doing the first three things solely off of a power meter or solely off of a heart rate i got one off of heart rate zones i would say including a power meter i guess you could call this like tracking progress or like i don't know what i'm trying to say here metrics to track a, a way to see how far you've come set goals for yourself i just assumed mm -hmm. everybody was already doing that goals <laughs> you shouldn't assume, Not necessarily. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like you can you can take training made quite it this a far without in. a power meter. <laughs> yeah, but but so, if so, so I, I agree. Like, if you want to, oh. yeah. So if you want to take it to the next level, this might mm -hmm. universally apply that having adding a power meter to your training regimen is yeah. is a somewhat low that would hanging fit in. Mark, yeah, that maximal. would fit in pretty closely. Yeah. Like, if somebody had to say, should I get a gym membership or a power meter? I think I would say. Ooh, that's a close one. <laughs> I think I would say gym membership. Yeah, because yeah. getting the power meter is not going to be a direct physiological gain. Could but... be if they're like always overtraining. You know, if they're always mm -hmm. going too hard on their endurance rides. But you could you could also measure that with heart rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about uh, gut training? Like your body's ability to digest carbs. Yeah. Okay, I, so I, I think now we're getting training. into stuff that's that's niche to whatever event you're training for. So gut training, heat training, altitude training. Gut training? Those what? You don't if you can digest think, more carbs, that's Yeah, but like some people gonna, only train for crits or cyclocross races. They don't need to digest you don't more think, carbs. Yeah, but for training, yeah, if we're talking about just training, I could see where in a race you don't intake carbs, but if you can digest more carbs in your training, your training's only going to be better. I, I I can see what I can see what you're talking about. I still think it's a niche. I and actually out of those three gut, like if we're saying gut, heat, altitude, I think out of those three, just in general, gut is probably the most important out of those three. Oh, okay, good. I thought you were going to say the opposite. I was like, no. don't even. Well, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> the opposite if you're training for a short altitude race. Like let's say XC Nationals happens to be at really high altitude and it's only mm. an hour and a half i would say altitude training is more important than gut training in that situation okay yeah okay i see what you're saying it, it, so so when we get into the when we get into the, i don't know this territory where we're talking about stuff that you need to do for specific races like you need heat training for hot races you need altitude training for altitude races i mean some would argue that you need altitude training for low altitude races too although i would say the research on that is it's like a little more shaky because there's some research that suggests that altitude training for low altitude races is not even really helpful. Although a lot of world tour teams are using altitude training for low altitude races, but now it's kind of race dependent, right? So, so I would say race specificity, slide that in right before all of those periodization because your periodization well, it's kind of the same should thing, be isn't affected it? by the race specificity. Mm -hmm. like the definition yeah, of periodization is to go from general training to specific training. Yeah. Block, block by block. Mm. Yeah. So I think you're talking, Dylan, you're talking about aspects of the race specificity that extend beyond like the physical training, like, yeah. like the yeah. workout sessions. Uh -huh. so you're talking there about we go. Uh, like external adaptations. Yeah. And, and those are all dependent on the demands of the race. Like if yeah. you're training for, so 
Uh, I'm trying to think of other examples that, but like gut training, I, heat I think, training, altitude I think training. Heat, I think heat training. If you're if you're going to a race in the heat versus going to the, a race in, at altitude, I think heat at, heat adaptation is more important than altitude adaptation. Mm -hmm. Well, heat heat adaptation can help with both. So I know, I know I knew you were going to say yeah. that, but <laughs> but I think there's a much more likely chance of performance suffering due to lack of heat adaptation than lack of altitude adaptation. Yeah. I mean, depends on the race. It could be a really cold high altitude race. That's what I'm saying. It just, it just depends on right. the, he's talking about two separate athletes, two separate like athletes. Oh, okay. An athlete training for what's more important, <laughs> this athlete that's going to the altitude race training or getting acclimatized to the altitude versus an athlete training for a mountain bike race in the dead heat okay. of texas yeah I, like, I, yeah i agree with that i i think that people actually overestimate how much altitude training gives you like i think that's a pretty marginal correct. gain yeah, yeah. Like, i think i, I think that, that people yes. think that if you don't live at leadville for a month before leadville then you're screwed like you might as well not go which i don't <laughs> think is the case at all i i think there you're obviously at a disadvantage but i think that disadvantage is in we're talking about like single digit percent, low single digit, percent. low single digit percent. Like it's not nearly as big as people think it is. Yeah. Because people forget that being fully, uh, I always say acclimatized. Is that the right word? That's acclimated. Right. I thought, well, acclimatized. Accl acclimated. I feel like acclimatized <laughs> is for like heat adaptation. Right? Well, but for weather. I mean, so anyway. acclimated, acclimated is off, often used to refer referred to the short term and acclimatize is more long term but okay. they both can be used but i feel like people forget even if they're 100 percent acclimated they're still not that doesn't mean they're getting 100 percent of their power that they would at sea level they're still yeah not even um, close yeah 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 again we're talking about low single digit percent increase between Mm -hmm. you know spending a month at leadville and then just showing up the day before <laughs> yep all right anything else anything else we want to where throw does, on that where list? does uh where does epo fall into this is that that's probably maximal right <laughs> <laughs> well i mean we could we could legitimately talk about supplements like yeah how much legal where we legal think supplements, supplements rank Legal supplements. Yes, yeah. I feel like that's the <clears throat> bottom of the list. Like if we, yeah, because we put nutrition maybe. far up there, and if you're eating a variety of like mm -hmm. good food, yeah. I mean, I, I like, personally, I put it, I put it behind, marginal. I put it behind uh, altitude, heat, gut training. I put it behind that. Yeah. So I yeah. guess the supplement could be like a, you know, your immediate recovery shake after. And that's pretty important. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's also, there's also people who, for whatever reason, they don't absorb a certain nutrient. Well, uh, like for example, one that comes to mind is like some people really, uh, really suffer with iron deficiency, which can have a huge impact on your performance. And it's like, Without iron supplementation, they would be significantly slower. But because they supplement with iron, they are faster. And that that actually, I mean, you could make the argument that that's like where where I would rank somebody who's iron deficient versus somebody who has sufficient iron is like, I mean, we're putting that kind of around the same level as like sleep, right? I mean, I mean, yeah, it can make a, I mean, it can make that big a difference. Yeah, yeah get your annual blood work kids yep uh okay cool well i think that pretty much covers that it. was good if anyone else has i think so if any of our listeners have any other uh maximal versus marginal training gains uh feel free to send it to us it'd be it'd be cool to hear what other people are kind of focused on um but yeah that was good we're gonna skip this next question right. for for now that was a long episode yep uh and then hendrick we'll get back to you on the topic of new science in endurance sports 
Okay. See you guys. See ya. See ya. See ya.